Potentially, um, because, well, one, um, I have some announcements and reminders, and then two, I'm going to hand out the next assignment so that you have it and can begin working on it. And we'll begin talking about that as well. And you know, I'm going to go through the announcements first before I open the floor up to uh, any questions from the first assignment. Um, that said, just to go ahead and let you know what the next assignment is, if we need to prepare you and your surroundings. Uh, we're going to be, the next assignment is about our, the advanced functions of the common scientific calculators. So if you don't have that out already, you want to make sure you get that out. Where did I actually have notes? There they are. Okay. Then the projector that I want to show you. So, this is not for you. This bracket is for my other lecture. Don't worry about any of these numbers. These test dates don't apply to you. I am about to write the test dates that will apply to you. So, do you copy those now shortly? tell you I would schedule the test dates in advance so that you would have them and be able to work around them. And what we're going to talk about right now. Today is Friday, February 5th. And uh, during the semester we will have two normal tests before the exam at the very end of the semester. So those two tentative test dates, these will be adjusted as need be, but I will only ever push them back. I will never make them earlier than advertised, just for your benefit. Test one is currently slated, not for this calendar month, but for next calendar month, March, Wednesday the 3rd. Test two, <coughs> pardon me, is tentatively slated for approximately a one month after that on April, Wednesday, April the 7th. <coughs> oh, jeez. Thank you, pardon me. Yep, past two days have been really cold. Today, woke up and it was, you know, south, winter, spring, warm. And even though I like that fact, the fact that there was a pressure shift makes me sneeze more. So, again, tentative dates, if um, something takes us longer or shorter to get through than I anticipate, I will, sorry, no, if something takes us longer to get through than I anticipate. I will make tests later than these points, but I will never say, guess what, we're having our test early. I just I hate that idea. I will never do it. Um, so these might change if they need to, and if you as individuals are unable to make the test that day for whatever reason, or if you have very specific academic accommodations that will require a specific setting or uh, any other variables, then please let me know that can, we can work around that. I will make sure all of your accommodations are met. And if you can't make whatever time the most of the class is taking the test, we can work out when you can pick it up. That said, let me know as soon as you know, because ideally I'd rather you get it done and over with early than have to come in after the fact and scramble for it. Uh, while we're on this subject, Let's go ahead. I have the browser tab open. I am going to show and glance at the exam periods at the end of the semester. This is the F lecture, right? You 
times at the G. I'm, I'm fairly certain. It's a hub. Okay. Which means our exam is Tuesday, May 11th at 1.30 p.m. Which means we're pretty nicely going to have all of our main, our main assessments all about a month apart from one another, which is just good symmetry in my brain. Again, I'll push these back if I have to. There's not much I can do about this one. But at least it's not Sunday, like one of my classes. So these are dates to keep in your head. I should actually verify this is F. I do have a G lecture, so I'm just going to write that down for their benefit. When is G? Month A at 8.30. So, dates to keep on your radar. I will be reminding you. Periodically, we'll never. Uh, I will definitely remind you at least the week before. We will never get to test day. I won't mention it by then. But keep these in mind. I will let you know when we get there what chap, what sort of units will be on each one. But generally speaking, we're going to be building on everything we do in the entire course because it's all foundational mathematics and eventually getting into the intro physics. Um, and whatever we cover. Between test two and the exam, there won't be a dedicated test on. It'll just be on the exam. Because I don't want to cram another test in at the last minute. I find that convenient among other things. So have those notes, notes, dates in your calendar. And if you have an individual conflict, please let me know. And Other miscellaneous announcements, I believe I declared in advance that this first homework assignment would be due next Wednesday, and I'm going to stick to that. Um, so in a minute, I'll open the floor to any lingering questions you guys have about those. Um, but today, I want to at least hand out the next assignment and begin going over it with you guys, and then well, we're going to try to adjust to the Turn in last week's homework on Wednesday, get the new homework assignment that same day. We begin learning and then we continue working on it together on the Friday. So we'll be here next Wednesday. So trying to get to that schedule. And that means that pull the calendar again. First assignment is due here. Nope, sorry. Here, February 10th. The assignment I will be handing you today will be due on the 17th. And from there, we should be close to the once per week schedule. Uh, I've been sending a lot of logistical information so far for you guys. Any questions about any of this information? Yes? When do you think we'll get into like actual like physics 1500 math? Well, technically, we are. It's just the math and less the principles. But I like the principles, and I'm going to try to show you where they will apply throughout the semester. Um, this week, advanced calculator functions. Next week, uh, the quadratic foiling. Uh, then, last couple of things before the first test is going to be geometry and trigonometry, which has very direct applications to the first couple of things you'll be doing in 1500. And I will be going over those same types of questions with you guys. Making physical triangles, trying to figure out what hypotenuse, and then making more abstract triangles with things like velocity and force. So we'll be getting into those. We kind of are already into those, just a little more on the math side and the physics side. I tend to think of most 
fields of study on a spectrum where you've got math as the most objective thing and art as the most subjective thing. You've got math on this side and then the next thing over is physics. Then chem, then bio, then um, psychology, sociology, and then way over here is art. So math is important. Like, we are basically doing physics, just in the more boring parts. Or at least the less physically interesting parts. We'll get to the more visually recognizable things shortly, I promise. Anything else? Okay. So questions or needs or concerns from the first assignment. Uh, if you feel that you are done and comfortable with it, I will go ahead and take it if you just don't want it um, sitting around anymore. Um, when What I'm looking for in terms of the like, layout of assignments, um, you don't have to write your answers on the first page. You can, and it will help me see them more easily, but you don't have to because I want your work anyway. Because I can see your work and I can grade, give you a lot of partial points based on what you did within your work. So what I want mostly is the front page with your name on it, and then attached to it all of your work, clearly labeled with what question it is and what your answer is for that question. They can be out of order. It helps me if they aren't. But they can be out of order. You know, we we're kind of jumping all over the place the other day when we're doing things together. And you can go front and back. I don't mind. I encourage actually save trees and uh, cram as many questions as you reasonably can, as neatly as you can, onto one page. Again, you try to cut down on the paper waste. Um, so if you feel that you are ready and done, I will go ahead and take it, but I won't say it's due now and it's due until Wednesday because I said that once and I'm going to stick to it. So. Any issues, problems, questions related to that today? Okay. If you are still wrapping it up in questions form over the weekend, do please email me. Um, and if there's nothing for that specifically, I want to go ahead and hand you the next assignment so that if you're done, you have something you can start working on. This particular one is about uh, advanced calculator functions, and I don't see us needing to spend too much time on this particular week's assignment. Um, if you've been using your scientific calculator much at all, you probably know most of these. Uh, that said, before going through all the materials for this specific class, there's a few things, at least one thing on here, I didn't even know my calculator could do, and I've been using the same one since sixth grade or seventh grade. Oh. Thank you. Welcome. So, does anyone not have a scientific calculator yet? Okay. It's being delivered. Okay. Well, in that case, um, Well, I will, if you do have one, do please have it out uh, because it'll be easier to have everyone find functions here together. If you're waiting on yours to be delivered, then um, very good notes. Um, and you can refer back to the recording if you need to. That said, I'm also okay if you just want to check out and I'll, you, we can talk more specifically and you can help with plug later. That said, again, all, most of these are right on the calculator phase. You've probably all been dealing with these before. So, mostly review, but important things to go through now so that you don't have
have to struggle with them later. So, Advanced Calculator 101. Um, first, little, first couple of questions themselves is mostly just substituting. And the way that this particular assignment is laid out, you will be told how to be using the calculator, to what to write down on your page, what to show that your calculator said. It, it's a little weird to have to, showing work is hard when the point of the assignment is use your calculator. Um, but the assignment uh, will tell you specifically what to put in, when to press enter, what to write down on your page. The first uh, couple of sections are mostly just substituting things in, same kind of algebra that we've been doing. Um, put numbers in question, you have to uh, find answer. Um, I'd like to do at least one of these with you. Well, what I'd like to do is talk about how to put these types of equations into your calculator because you can enter everything in one fell swoop and press enter and that's it. But doing so can occasionally lead to trouble if you don't input it correctly in the way that the machine will be able to understand. So let's look at the first question together. This is a sample in uh, knowing how to translate things into machine speak. And this marker is already low on ink. So, first question, we are given the formula AB plus 5A plus ABC over C, and then we are told A equals 5, B equals 3, and C equals 2.6. So, we have our formula, we have things to plug in for all of our variables. We can start plugging in so that we can, I recommend writing it out with everything in it so that you can then copy it into your calculator. So, in order, we're going to have 5 times 3 times B plus 5 times A, A is already a 5, so that's 5 times 5, plus ABC, 5 times 3 times 2.6. All of that divided by C, 2.6. Now, if you're asked to put this into your calculator all at once, press enter to get your answer. So we need to figure out the best way to translate this into machine speed. Because something that gets repeated a lot in this department, even if when you bought the calculator it was advertised as a smart calculator, it's a dumb calculator. Because all machines are dumb, they can only do what they were programmed to do. They don't think good. They only do literally what you tell them. So if we were to put this in Literally, I'm going to try to write it out as one's first instincts might be. We have 5 times 3 plus 5 times 5 plus 5 times 3 times 2.6 divided by 2.6. Does anyone see any potential issues with what would happen if this is what we put in our calculator? Very good. This division will only be applied to this last term because the machine will literally look at just this and only do this piece of division before moving on to the rest of it. So this is an exercise in properly putting your own parentheses into the question. We want this to happen to the entire problem, so we need to put parentheses around the entire numerator and then make sure the denominator acts on all of it. 
the order of operations tells it, finish everything in the parentheses first, then do the division. That said, everything within the parentheses should still be okay, because it'll do the multiplication before the addition. That said, I end up doing, when I do these sorts of things myself, I tend to use parentheses more than the multiply sign. So five open parentheses, three closed parentheses is what the calculator will use. The calculator will look at this and do multiplication. But I prefer it this way so that everything stays attached and there's fewer signs in between everything. Because maybe it's just me, but an endless stream of pluses and x's all starts to bleed together. If you prefer it that way, great. The calculator will still do this as it is written, but just to make you aware of why I write it the way I do. That does mean you will have to, if you did do it like this, you would need two parentheses, one after the other, one to close out 2.6, one to close out this entire set. So, really, there's only one modification you need to make there. The second one, number two, yes, yeah, sorry. Quick question. Um, yes. When you're putting it in the calculator as parentheses five times parentheses three, do we have to put a multiplication sign in front of the parentheses, or is it okay for the calculator just to You, now, this might depend on the model. Everyone I've ever dealt with, if you have one number next to parentheses, number, closed parentheses, it will just do multiplication. Um, I know mine is super far away, but I recommend you try it with me. I'm going to do five times three, so that should give us 15, it does. I'm then gonna do five open parentheses, three closed parentheses, and I also get 15. When we get our final decimals, do you have a preference on what we round to or how many decimal places you round to? Well, since we're going to be talking about significant figures in this class, it might be worth talking a little bit about that. Uh, in this specific question, we have five with only this one digit, three with only this one digit, and then the 2.6. Technically speaking though, whole integers have infinite precision, so we don't care about the sig figs on those, we only care about the one that had the decimal point. So, if I was being sig fig accurate, I would say your answer should have two sig figs. So, what, sorry, I haven't actually worked the answer out yet. Um, in, uh, I don't have my notes in front of me. So, what I get when I work this whole thing out is 30.3846. And what I usually would like to see is I usually end up habitually cutting things off at the hundredths place. I feel like that's usually enough precision for my brain to understand. But in terms of significant figures, we have one and two. So this is wait, zeros are Self basic math, real quick, because I haven't had to write down on that. Okay, yes. So that one is used for more than just for writing. If you overline that zero to say that this is the second and last significant digit, 
you can write as much as you want after it, and this will technically be correct in terms of significant figures. Yes. We should only have two, so that's going to be the three and the zero. I like to write the rest of it, but it would technically be acceptable if you round it to the 30. But I like the hundredth place, so I would write it like this. Yes? Don't you take the lowest number of students that get there? Correct. But there's a weird there's exception a with whole integers. And by whole integers, I mean we have just five and just three. And do write this in your notes. Whole integers have infinite precision. So typically, if it's just a number with no decimals attached, you don't count it in your sig fig assessment. Because say you multiply anything by one, one has only one significant figure if you don't include this rule. So suddenly you can reduce every single question down to every single number down to just its first digit. So this rule is to avoid that type of issue. So We'll talk more about this later. It's not going to be a huge deal right now. Usually, if sig figs don't matter or if it's just way too difficult to try to find them in a given moment and it's not extremely important that you have them yet, my general rule is you can usually cut off at the hundredth place. That's just what I do usually as default. Um, I'd like to look at the second one real quick, just to get another example of how to make sure you input things correctly in the calculator. So let's look at number two. We are given, first of all, a pretty big formula, which might look a little familiar. Actually, a version of this formula is on the first assignment. We have two, P2 minus P1 plus 2 rho g open parentheses h2 minus h1 plus rho v squared all in the parentheses and all over another rho which is also still inside of the bracket. Again, this formula does feature on homework 1. You see it in question 12 where we solved it for x. So really the full thing here is x equals this. Uh, your answer can simplify down to this if you do a little bit more algebra to it. If your answer doesn't look exactly like this on the first assignment, that is completely fine. This is just something you can turn it into. And again, this formula refers to uh, the differences in pressure between two different zones based on all the different factors in each zone affecting the pressure there, like the native air pressure and the velocity of the air, things like that. Now we are given a bunch of very strange looking numbers to plug in here, which are the actual constants that you will be utilizing when you are doing pressure questions. So, start plugging things in. Two, open parentheses, P2 is a 3.025 times 10 to the fifth minus 1.01325 times 10 to the fifth plus 2 times rho. Rho is 1.025 times 10 to the third times g, 9.81, times, open parentheses, h2, 0 0.35, minus h1, 0 0.03, 
plus rho 1.025 times 10 to the third times 15.2 squared. Uh, all of that over rho again. Zero two five times ten to the third plus parentheses. So when I'm writing this out, I do tend when I'm substituting a number into a variable, I tend to instead of just writing the letter or just writing the number in place of the letter, I do tend to default to writing it within parentheses to make sure that in my own writing it looks separate from everything else. And that way it can be just next to whatever it's being multiplied by without having to put in a multiplication sign or something like that. Now, putting this as it's currently written into our calculators should probably be pretty okay. It's just a doozy. There's a lot of things here, so which is why I recommend writing it down and on paper before just putting it into your calculator. Because having it that extra step, put the thought into it, you know what you're going to put in before you start typing, and you can refer back to it before you press enter. Yes. When so I just try to find like the first part, the two times the three hundred two five, just that first parentheses. Okay. But it said like it, it was long, so then I added another parenthesis, so it did like the inside of the times two. But I think it's messing up, but I don't know why. Can you use like the double E, or do you have to actually do times ten to the fifth? You can absolutely do a little double E. Because it's not good. It's telling me like a quick syntax error. Right. That. So I don't know like how you would plug that in then, if, if you wanted to do a double E. Right. I I do like the little E because it's. It can. It ends up looking like a less cluttered screen, and so I'll, in a second, revise this to be what I would actually type in using that shortcut. Yes. Okay. I don't know why I learned this, but could you just use the store button on your calculator and just like plug in the value? Yes, you can. That's actually the part of this assignment I didn't know you could do before I was reading through this for my notes. For some reason, none of my teachers ever taught me about the store function, which. Yeah. Baffles me somewhat. Yes, you can absolutely use the store function. In fact, I'd recommend it. This is probably just the method I'm used to because I haven't had access to it because I didn't know it existed. So that's maybe a, that's more of a me problem actually. If you are familiar with the store function, it is a part of this assignment, the back page is entirely utilizing the store function. So you can absolutely use that, and in fact I would recommend it, but I want to at least look at these problems from the old man angle, just to make sure that if you aren't using a store function, you can still input things correctly. But yes, that is absolutely a useful tactic. As for how I would literally put this into my calculator, it would look something like we do the square root, which would open a bracket for the square root. Within that, we've got two times all of this. So I would do two, open parentheses, 3.025. What is that little e looking here? Okay. E5, I would actually put that within its own set of parentheses. Now, is anyone unfamiliar with this specific small blocky E? Yeah. Okay, that is A-OK. -okay. This is distinct from the lowercase kind of script E from the last assignment. They are different buttons. They accomplish different things. This is the natural log, and it is its own unique number. It is a number that has a definition. That's not what we're using today. That's a different button. This button 
is, at least on my calculator, it's above the comma function. It, look, it might, the button itself might say double small blocky E. And I can usually tell that this is a specific E question because it's a small uppercase E that is all blocks and angled and right angles as opposed to any sort of script or slanted nature. And this symbol completely stands in for times 10 to the. So if you do any number, that E and then the exponent that would have gone on the 10, it'll give you the same answer. And as proof of concept, I'm going to do 3.025 times 10 raised to the fifth, press enter, and then I'm going to do 3.025 5, enter. So I like that because it's fewer things to physically type in and it just looks a little less cluttered as a result. I would also put this whole part of the problem within its own set of parentheses because if you don't and you then go on to do minus 1.01325 block E5. I'm always afraid that it's going to do 5 minus this before it does the exponent. I'm not entirely sure if the computer would make that error, but I'm always afraid that it will. Order of operations says it shouldn't, but I'm paranoid and my calculator is real dumb. So I will always put a parentheses at the end of one number and then put the other one within its own parentheses as well. I tend to over parenthesize just to make sure the calculator doesn't do these types of things, just in case. And so that is this entire first term done. Might not be any shorter, but it's at least calculator proof. Then the next piece, similar, 1.025 block E, check my notes again. Yeah, this is the third. So 1.025 block E3, although if you take a second, this is equal to this, if you'd rather just write that out instead. Either should work though, whatever your preference. Then times G, so in parentheses, 9.81. Does that number look familiar to anyone? If you want to talk physics for just a brief second. Gravity. Very good. This is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth's surface. This number will show up a lot in the rest of your science career but that is in units of meters per second squared. If you translate it into like feet, it's gonna look very different. Next term, this one will be pretty okay if you leave it by itself. I don't foresee any issues with just O parentheses, number minus number, close parentheses. Then last but not least, 1.025 block E3, 15.2, and I would put the squared within the parentheses, just in case. Make sure that the calculator is only applying the squared to that one number. And that is everything in the numerator. Then we have to take care of the denominator. Once more, if you just do divided by and the number, then it will only do this division on this term. So what we need to do is, we need to come back to the front Put another parentheses right there in front of the two, and 
then close that parenthesis right here before the division sign. Now the division will only be done, will be done upon the entire thing, the entire numerator is within its own set. And as it is, calculator should look at this and be just fine. You could put another parenthesis on the end here, which would close out the parentheses of the square root. But most machines are able to work without needing to put that there. If you don't absolutely want to. And it's a doozy. It would absolutely be simplified with the store function, but this is how I would machine proof it. Excuse me. Uh, since you brought up the store function, I'd actually like to talk about that pretty because it would be useful in the rest of the assignment. Any questions about these two so far? Yes? Um, That's a great question. Um, technically speaking, yes, this particular answer might only legally have two sig figs. It gets a little convoluted when you factor in that you are adding and subtracting, but this is the fewest number of sig figs present, and that's likely the one that's going to carry through. Yes? So wouldn't we have a number that, if it's two sig figs, but it's in the hundreds, do you want to like turn it into um, like a technical notation? Turn it into scientific notation? Yeah. Oh, I said I. I am not especially bothered. Uh, you could write that as 3.5 times 10 to the negative 1. That would show which two are the significant figures. Um, but, but this one is under a radical, so. Yes, it is. I don't actually know what that does to the sig figs. I haven't had to deal with that in a little while. Because if we solve it, like we just we put it under the radical and then write whatever we did, but would that affect it if you put it in scientific? For the sake of putting it in the calculator and proceeding, I'd keep it like this. The calculator would also be able to understand what you mean if you didn't put that zero there. Like it would accept. Without much issue, I think. As for how the square root would affect the sig figs, since it's finding what times what would create your answer, I would assume that number of sig figs from within the radical would carry through. Okay, I'm trying to figure out just like what the right answer is for the final answer. Ah. Again, what I would usually do is just write the number down to the hundredths place, and you can label which of the two numbers are the significant ones that are with, an air, with a line above them. That's how I like it, because then you get the extra digits if you want them, but you still know which ones are the mathematically significant. very soon, don't want to hold you guys up too much, but I do want to draw your attention to the store function, because I think this is neat, because I didn't know about it before, as I've probably said multiple times today. So, uh, who also hasn't used the store function yet? Okay, I'm not the only one that said I have less of an excuse, because I've been doing this for so long. So, what that button does is, you ever thought it was weird how some of these calculators have like an alpha function where you can then put in a bunch of letters that don't by themselves mean anything? I always use it to just type things and type words into my calculator. It turns out most of these machines have a function where you can store a constant 
into those numbers as variables. I have already done this with the, did I do K or Q yesterday? Uh, alpha and K, okay. I did it with Q. So what I recommend you guys do is, um, just, to, just to prove that the number of the letters don't mean anything normally, if you've never used the store function before, if you type one of those letters in here, all of my letters are the third green function above the normal button. So if I press alpha to access the green letters and I hit the letter to the button to spawn in the A, I have never set the A to equal anything. So if I press whoops, enter, oops, looks like I did set the A to equal something. Let's use Z instead. So I'm going to do alpha and Z. That's a U. What's wrong with me? Alpha Z. Press enter. It gives me a zero because this machine has no definition for Z. But you can make it have a definition for Z if you press. If you type in whatever number you want, I'm just going to use 25. And then press the stow button. It's the store function. The, air, the button itself might say STO and then an arrow sign. Uh, whatever version of that your machine has. If you have your number present and you press stow, what should appear is an arrow. And then put in whatever letter you want that number to be. So if I want to be able to type in a Z and it always mean 25, I can do 25 store Z and it'll put the 25 into the Z button. I press enter, it then says 25. I'll go back in and just do Z and press enter. And now it says 25 instead of zero. Yes? Would you have to go back and undo that? Yes. So you basically restore numbers? You can theoretically restore something any number of times because I previously had it as zero, now it's 25. I can repeat that with, let's say, 55. 55, store, Z, enter, and then hit Z again. Now it says 55. So you would just like redo it, but it doesn't mean this anymore. You would have to go back and clear your last. Yes, it it's automatically saves it until you overwrite it. And overwriting it is just the one function. And this is useful because in your physics classes, and really any formula algebra-based science class, they're going to be dealing with a lot of the same constants over and over and over again. As this specific assignment says, it asks you to store um, k, q, e, and p. These are very common constants that you might have interacted with in chemistry already because the value it says P is the mass of a proton, E is the mass of an electron, Q is the charge of an electron and proton, and K is the electrostatic constant. These terms will come up a lot, and if you store them in their symbols on the calculator, you don't have to remember or retype them over again, which you could also do for these questions. You could store these constants in as the numbers and just type the numbers in. Either method is valid. Whatever, however you want to work it, those are two ta different tactics that can work for you. The store function is revolutionary in my brain. I hope that it makes sense and can make your lives easier. There's definitely a lot of constants I need and I never remember. Future note though, this physics department, you never have to memorize constants that be given to you. I can't remember them and I haven't been fired yet. Uh, so, uh, fin I do recommend making sure you are done with the chapter 10 assignment first, but then do begin looking over the two. The, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm crossing streams. You can be back and you can go. I just like rambling. Um, make sure you finish the first assignment first then move on to the second one, but have it be looking at it. And I will see you again next Wednesday. Um.
Have a good weekend. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy.